Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Today we're talking about uh, a slightly off-beam car again, uh, not a sort of take your breath away supercar, not all blood and thunder and um, lots of noise and wheel spin and all that sort of good stuff. Talking about something subtle but a sort of a fist in a silk glove really is how I would describe it and that's this car, the V12 engined Jaguar or in this case Daimler. It's one and the same car actually. This was a real sort of turning point for lots of reasons. Jaguar were the first car manufacturer to really bring the V12 into almost the realm of the real world. Uh, you had Cadillac, Maybach, uh, Rolls-Royce in the 1920s and 30s, Hispano Suiza, lots of sort of extremely esoteric top-end manufacturers all had V12s at some stage or another and Ferrari and Lamborghini continued that trend in the 1960s or the 1940s onwards in Ferrari's case. But Jaguar really pulled the trick of developing a V12 engine that was not quite for the masses, but certainly not for telephone number money either. And they used some very, very clever trickery and engineering to get to that. Um, more of that in a minute. But the shape itself, this is a Series 2 car, Series 2 XJ Saloon, it's based on, it's called the Jaguar XJ12 in Jaguar terms, or the Daimler Double Six in Daimler terms. The only difference between the Daimler and the Jaguar was what's called badge engineering, which was very prevalent in the 1970s. Rolls-Royce and Bentley did it as well. Same car, different badge, different hubcaps, different grill, one or two other things, maybe the instruments, little symbol saying either D or, or J on the instruments, something as simple as that, and that was it. You either had a Daimler or a Jaguar some trim differences, um, that was the norm. Then if you took it up to the next level, you had this car. And this is called a Vanden Pla double six. And British Leyland, who were making these cars at the time, bought the Dutch coach builder, uh, Vanden Pla, the rights to the name, and they turned it into the same as Ford did with gear. You had a Capri gear, Granada gear, Mustang gear. In the 1970s, it was a sort of bodybuilder, uh, stroke coach builder, stroke styling house um, that they added on to their top of the range cars to make them sound posher. Um, and this is a Vandenpla double six. This car had lots of different things about it over and above the Jaguar and the Daimler. It had metallic paintwork in these gorgeous six shades they did these in, gorgeous colours. This is a sage green. It had the vinyl roof, which is an acquired taste. And it had a different interior, more luxurious individual rear seats as opposed to a bench, different woodwork. It had standard automatic air conditioning, which was revolutionary. This was arguably the first car ever to have automatic climate control. And it had things like these beautiful pressed chrome wheels, which were an optional extra on the Jaguar and the Daimler, but was standard on this car. And this car was a hefty price more than the Jaguar or the Daimler. Um, but what really took, impressed me as a child about this car was the elegant looks, yes, and the, for me, the, the shape is still breathtaking. It's just so utterly graceful. But it was the performance as well. Um, I mean, this car in period was 140 mile an hour plus car, nudging 150 miles an hour with the later fuel injected engine like this one. Yeah, and I've got a, an edition of Motor Magazine here from, um, 1977. Uh, it's showing an XJ 5.3C, the coupe on the front actually, because they did a road test of it. But um, they go on to say it's essentially the same car, really. Uh, one of Leyland's world beaters. Effortless but startling performance from uncannily smooth and quiet V12 engine. Um, as a comfortable, elegant, spacious, long distance express, it is in a class of its own. And if we have a look at the price of these cars new, I've got a, a price list here in the same edition of motor. And the Jaguar XJ 5.3 EFI, electronic fuel injection, £9,400. Um, the Daimler version, which is slightly more luxurious, is £9,700. Um, but the Vanden Pla 66 EFI is 12768 So this was 30% more expensive than the Jaguar equivalent just because it's got metallic paint, it's got the fully automatic climate control and other luxury refinements, the pressed chrome wheels, 
30% more. I mean, this made this car very, very exclusive, but compared to rivals, it was still good value for money. The Mercedes 450 SEL 6.9, similar performance, was £22,999. So it was over twice the price of this car, um, and it arguably didn't cost it its occupants as well as this car did. That's what Motor Magazine said about it. Um, Road and Track said similar things. They loved the V12 as well. They didn't like the reliability or lack of it and build quality too much. But that was unfortunately, as we know, British Leyland at the time. But just the details on this car are achingly subtle and elegant and lovely. And this car is a very, very rare survivor. I wouldn't like to put a figure on how many of them are left. This is the Series 2 car, but I'm guessing maybe 30, um, maybe 40. And this car is all original. Um, all the chrome on it is still beautiful. Uh, there's no pitting, no, no nothing. It's just absolutely perfect, like the day it was built in 1977. This is factory original paint with its beautiful original gold coach line, which was an optional extra, but standard on the Vanden Pla. This is actually cellulose, and if you polish it, some of the paintwork actually comes off with a cloth. So if you look at chauffeur-driven Rolls Royces and Daimlers, as this was when it was new, what used to happen was some of the paint would come off with the cloth and being a metallic finish, it had uh, tiny, tiny, tiny particles of aluminium in the paint. And if you polish it, um, what you do is actually, you're polishing partly the aluminium flakes that are actually touching the surface. And the reason these went dull was because the aluminium would start to oxidize with, the, with the, the outside air in the paint and it would go dull. So really your chauffeur could polish them with a coating, a polish, and that would last so long and stop them oxidizing, but eventually he'd have to polish it again. And they actually wore through. If you look at a chauffeur driven car such as this in the 70s, a Daimler, Jaguar, Rolls Royce, whatever, you can see on the edges quite often bits of primer if it's the original paintwork because it's been polished away by chauffeurs or car valeters polishing uh, to keep them shining, keep that luster. These days we don't have that problem because um, paints are clear over base, so they have a lack of finish over them, um, which means the metallic never gets near the fresh air or the atmosphere. But all this to say it's remarkable that this car has survived, uh, that the paintwork hasn't worn through, um, it could do with a polish now, but we don't polish it that often because every time we do, as I've said, we're taking a bit of the paint off and there's only so much paint on it. But to have a car survive like this, in this condition, unrestored original from 1977 is incredible. The car has only done 21,000 miles from new, original documented. Fabulous. It's got to be the best Van Den Pla double six in the world, of its age anyway. Everything about the car, the woodwork on the interior, the leather, the carpets, every last bit that isn't uh, a tire or a belt or a hose is original. It really is a remarkable piece of kit. And don't forget this car with the V12 engine could do well north of 140 miles an hour, which in the 1970s for a four-door saloon was moving, probably push it to 150 with the later fuel injected engine like this one here's got. 295 brake horsepower, Similar figure for torque, and it was low down where you need it as well. This car, to describe, was effortless, really. Effortless and almost silent. It was actually the most refined car in the world. It was more refined even than a, a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow or Silver Shadow 2. And it had soft suspension because it had a fairly soft ride. By American standards, the ride was firm. By European standards, it was super soft but it actually within reason could be hustled around as well. Fantastic achievement, really. The wonder of Jaguar's achievement with this was that they brought the V12 engine to a whole new level of people, really, a whole new quantity of people, because they made them in their thousands. Um, and uh, Jaguar were very clever about this engine. It started out as um, a four cam engine, like the Lamborghini and later Ferrari equivalents, but, um, it took up so much space, uh, the top end of the engine with the four cams and all the carburettors and everything, 
Um, they ditched that because they originally intended it to be a Le Mans winning competition engine. That was why it was developed uh, initially in the 1950s, then in the XJ13, which there was only ever one of originally made. They decided when they changed the project and um, Walter Hassan and his team turned it into a road car engine, they found it could be more efficient, more torquey, um, and just smoother and more refined, low down, more docile, if they actually ditched the twin cam heads and went for what's called a heron head, which is a very, very simple combustion chamber design. The cylinder heads are actually flat with the valves in a line, inlet exhaust, inlet exhaust, etc. And the combustion chamber is actually in the top of the piston. It's in the crown of the piston. And that was one of the secrets of this engine's super smooth success. Some people actually went as far as to say it was the finest internal combustion engine in manufacture in period in the 1970s. Um, not all people who owned them would agree with that because they had the usual British Leyland unreliability issues. Um, but if you got a good one, they were great. If you got a bad one, they were terrible. There was nothing in between. But the V12 engine, very quiet, very refined, beautiful power delivery. It's not top endy or frenetic or anything like that. It will pull from idle. Um, and um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get it running back on 12 cylinders and then take it out for a run. Well, we've dug the car out of uh, storage. It's been here for a while, so we need to breathe uh, some life back into the car. Uh, <clears throat> and I've ascertained that it's running on nine cylinders, uh, two down on this bank and one down on that one. Check the ignition system. That's all fine. We've got a good, strong spark at uh, all 12 cylinders. Fairly basic stuff on this uh, era of engine. One ignition coil, remarkably, does... Uh, a, um, serves the whole engine. You've got a distributor, big Lucas distributor here in the middle with 12 ignition leads going obviously to the firing order of the spark plugs. So all that's working. This is where the tricky bit comes because um, I mean I've come across all sorts of problems. It, people, I've had situations where people have been driving around on these engines years ago on nine cylinders thinking that they were fine but a bit, bit short on performance. And they brought them in, I remember an XJS I did in the 1980s, and um, it was running on nine pots, and it was the uh, trigger disc in the distributor. All 12 things weren't triggering the ignition system. Uh, the ignition system on this is a very early electronic ignition. It's called a Lucas Opus system, oscillating pickup system, or as it was more commonly known, Opus, because it failed with regular, um, regular occurrence. So uh, anyway, um, this one's fine, so it's not that. Uh, what I'm going to do now is an old trick because I suspect some of the injectors aren't working. They've stuck the fuel injectors. Jaguar always intended this engine to have fuel injection, but it started life with the four pretty awful Stromberg carburettors on it. And they're a pig to synchronise and a pig to get absolutely right. You can get them close and they're fine, but to get perfection takes time. Um, the induction system was a horrible compromise on the, uh, the, the carburetor V12s. Much more elegant on the fuel injection system. Um, the petrol gets to the right place at the right time in the right quantity and in the right form, i.e. atomized, not a puddle on the bottom of the inlet manifold that's suddenly sucked in. So that's all good. But the problem is, I suspect at least two of the problems on, as of the three on this are injectors that are not triggering. So I have a little trick for... Uh, rejuvenating them back into life. We've got a 12 volt feed here, and I'm gonna pull the trigger wire. Uh, this is one of the offending cylinders here, number four on this bank. So I'm gonna remove carefully, because these rubber covers are 43 years old and they're a bit delicate. I don't particularly want to damage it. There it goes, off it comes. And we'll just offer the 12 volt feed up to the terminals and see if we can get a tune out of this injector. <clears throat> just very carefully put that on the terminals. No, nope, nothing there. Just as I thought. The injector is actually stuck. So I'm just going to keep doing this because normally a good direct 12 volt feed 
does free them off. Yeah, there it is. That's, that's ticking away nicely now. That's come back to life. That's great. That was stuck. That injector was stuck. It wasn't ticking at first. It, I can feel it actually. You can just feel a slight vibration. You can't hold the, uh, the wire on because it burns out the windings in the injector. It's designed to work for a fraction of a second only, of course, the fuel injector. Uh, so that's one down. And I'm now gonna try the others and see if that's the problem. I suspect it is on this age of car. So that is a result. We may even have a 12 cylinder engine yet. Well, I've done uh, the two injectors on this bank. Um, number two was also uh, not playing. Um, so I brought that one back to life. And also number one on this bank was similarly, it was injecting actually, but very, very slightly and very sporadically. So that's got a good strong click to it now, tick as it should have. Uh, we plugged that back in. Hopefully, the engine now will uh, start and obviously um, chime in on all 12, if we've got it right. Yeah, I'm either one of the saddest people in the world or a very discerning car enthusiast, uh, one or the other. But um, I'd go as far as to say I like these cars so much if I could have a top 30 collection of cars ever made, it would have one of these in it. I just love the intoxicating, uh, I mean, it is a luxurious cabin, still lovely even now, this beautiful, uh, almost mirror finish woodwork, all original from 43 years ago, never been touched. Uh, we have put a new headlining in it because the headlinings sag on them very badly, they come unstuck. So uh, I, I will admit to doing that. Um, but nothing else has been touched in this car. And what, what I just love is the, um, is the uncanny refinement of them. Um, but the first time I traveled in one, uh, I, I was lucky enough to be a young lad, a, a friend's dad had one. And um, I couldn't believe how, how quiet it was and smooth. I mean, it just glides along. Um, and, um, it just really stuck with me, uh, but but also the performance. It was uh, it was a really really and still is a, a fast car. Um, obviously, it's nowhere near supercar performance then or now, but it can still move. Um, and the car that really um, really sort of the next car, the most refined car. I remember a friend actually gave me a Lexus LS 400, uh, a 1993 one in the early noughties because it had sort of, things were starting to go wrong with it. Nothing against the car, great car, but um, it sort of, um, and I was really impressed with the refinement of it. That V8 engine really raised the bar again. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it's just a lovely car. The rev counter isn't working, I noticed. That will work, because it usually does. Um, it's just bringing everything out of, out of its slumber. Um, and I'm just letting the car warm through. Uh, oil pressure's great. The oil pressure on these from the factory should be 63 pounds per square inch at 3,000 RPM. Uh, and this, this oil pressure is very, very good. We know that. Um, in fact, the car is in really good shape. We've redone all the brakes, uh, brake discs, rotors, as they're called them, across the pond. And uh, the back ones are difficult to do. You have to drop the entire rear suspension assembly, the cradle, to, uh, to gain access to them. They're inboard the brakes, but that's, that's how they made them. And that helps with the smooth ride because the brakes aren't next to the wheels. It's less unsprung weight, as it's called, which makes the ride smoother. Well, here we are. The engine's warmed up, um, but it looks like the rev counter hasn't because it's still not working. But um, one of the most amazing things about this car for me is the, you know, I'm, I'm big on NVH, noise, vibration, harshness. And um, this car uh, was so refined in period, it was the most refined car in the world, bar none. Mercedes couldn't approach it. Fantastic 
piece of machinery, an engineering job, though the, the 6.9 450SL Merc was, um, it couldn't approach this in terms of suspension uh, con um, smoothness, uh, although it was a little more controlled. Um, but this um, just glides along, it just wafts. And um, that, considering you've got a 300 horsepower almost, uh, five and a half litre, 5343 cc v12 in front of you you could just are not aware of it there were analogies in period from car magazines about being pulled along by a turbine um, of course big electric motor of course haha <laughs> we've arrived at that now but um, you know it was uh, it was just a revelation this engine in the 1970s but um, I'm just going to drop it down this gearbox the GM 400 doesn't like uh, kicking down but I'm going to coax it into first and um, we'll just try the acceleration. Uh, now that we've got it running back on all 12 cylinders, it should be there, plenty of power, um, really quiet from the inside, but of course you've got all that going on on the outside. So we'll just open it up and there we go. Just beautiful. Beautiful, smooth power, um, just there instantly. Um, smooth, smooth power. Uh, for a car from 43 years ago, it moves, particularly for a, a big saloon. Um, just beautiful. And you're surrounded by this lo these lovely materials, this mirror finish burr walnut, all original from 1977. And the Vandenplatt, again, has got the burr walnut. The standard Jaguars and Daimlers had the, uh, the slightly lower grade, maybe grained walnut or not quite. The burr on a walnut tree is only 18 inches of the whole trunk. It's a tiny bit of the walnut tree that actually has that beautiful burled, as the Americans call it, burr finish, which uh, Rolls Royce was so beloved of um, Rolls Royce. Even Mercedes in the 6.9 I was talking about, uh, the standard fitment in that was burr walnut. Um, before uh, Zebrano Wood came in, which was so beloved of Mercedes in the 1980s. Um, and this car, again, just, just absolutely almost silent. Just beautiful. So again, um, we'll just open the taps and uh, just savour that creamy, cut glass, smooth, V12 uh, power and again the beauty of this car is it's got torque but it, it's not cami or uh, it's very linear the power delivery um, it's just there whoa there she goes fabulous fabulous um, just so smooth and so quiet there's just a tiny bit of induction roar Jaguar went to a massive amount of trouble to, uh, to dampen things down. You can hardly hear, even at 6,000 RPM as that was, when it upshifted just over 6,000 into uh, second gear. Negligible noise, really, unless you're outside. And we have recorded the exhaust noise as well, so you can hear a bit of, uh, you can hear a bit of that. Maybe when we go around this corner. We just open it up again. Beautiful. Well, we're looking briefly at another car we got in the workshop here uh, at the same time, which is the coupe version of the Jaguar XJ12 or Daimler 66. They never actually made this officially in Van den Pla form, so it's a poor relation, but hardly that. It still has the brilliant, magnificent V12 engine in it. But the really interesting thing about this is, like a few cars in the 70s, the BMW E9, the 3.0-litre CSL, few American cars, um, 
It's got what's called a pillarless construction. So uh, you have these frameless doors, as they're called, with just the, the drop glass, just the window in. And the same here. And one of the really magnificent achievements that uh, the Jaguar engineers did, and I was privileged to have a visit from uh, Ian Callum, the head of design of Jaguar at the time, who explained to me that he actually uh, exercised them quite considerably to come up with a window mechanism that um, it creates the pillarless look, which I'll show you in a minute, but also um, is extremely good at wind uh, suppression because obviously this, this is a bit loose. Uh, that's how they're meant to be. So how does it seal? Lots of cleverness is the answer. These days we have, on a lot of cars like this, you have the window drops a few millimetres when you open the door handle as a micro switch in the door handle to uh, trigger the drop glass to drop. And then when you close it, it goes up into a channel. Uh, and this is to keep the wind noise out. Jaguar managed to do that in the 1970s without all that trickery. But they did employ some other trickery. So I'm going to um, first of all put this window down, which is fairly conventional, nothing terribly exciting about that. But this one is a little bit special. How about that? And this is where it's called the pillarless construction. And Motor Magazine, going back to that road test again, and other magazines in period, commented that even at high speeds, cruising on the, uh, the German autobahns at 130 miles an hour, uh, or thereabouts, or even more, the windows barely made a whisper of wind noise. Just part of the incredible package that this car was, in terms of almost superhuman refinement at the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, really, really special. I'll now put the window up. Um, and very few of these actually work correctly or at the speed at which they're meant to work. This one does. Uh, quite often they're sticky and clunky and slow. Um, there is quite a complicated mechanism in here which we've worked on uh, and got it up to snuff. Just a really, really interesting aspect of the, the coupe version of this car. And of course, just as fast as a saloon. So now we can put this window up as well and close the car up and it's good for doing 140 miles an hour in um, without barely turning the radio up as you do well that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video if you've enjoyed it please subscribe please share and uh, we'll be back again with something else soon